And then not only are we talking about that this is regressive to women, we're commodifying the woman's body, but we're really, in short, we are commodifying babies. We're, this is the buying and selling of babies, and it cannot be separated. Women are currently being erased in culture, and I want to amplify their voices and share their stories. Welcome back to This is a Woman podcast. I know what you may be thinking. Where have you been? It has been a minute, maybe almost a month, maybe three weeks since the last podcast. And I always say every Monday morning, um, yeah, I have been in a season of life where I've been in the middle of moving. Um, I was in DC for two weeks for work. So just a lot was going on in life and I figured instead of giving you guys low quality content, um, I would just wait till life kind of resettled a little bit. And so life has resettled and today's episode, I am so excited for you guys to listen to it. We talk about surrogacy. Um, surrogacy can be a touchy topic. It can be a heavy topic as it revolves around infertility um, some of the times. And so I didn't want to just do research on my own and relay information to you guys. So I have a great guest that's on today. Her name is Callie Fell. And again, this is a heavy issue. This is a big issue. So I'm going to just read you guys word for word her bio because I want you to just be aware of how informed and how knowledgeable Callie is on this stuff. So Callie Fell, MS, BSN, RN, started her professional career as a scientist in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, utilizing a Master of Science degree in Animal Sciences with an emphasis on reproductive physiology and molecular biology from Purdue University. While assisting in the investigation of endometriosis and preterm birth, Callie simultaneously pursued a degree in nursing with hopes of working with women as a perinatal nurse. After meeting Jennifer at a conference, Callie became interested in the work of the Center for Bioethics and Culture and started volunteering with the organization. It is obvious that Callie is passionate about women's health. She continues to work as she has for the past six years as a perinatal nurse and has worked with the CBC since 2018, first as volunteer writer, then as a staff research associate, and now she's the executive director for the Center for Bioethics and Culture. In 2021, Callie co-directed the CBC's newest documentary, Transmission, What's the Rush to Reassign Gender? Callie also hosts the popular podcast, Venus Rising, and is the program director for the Paul Ramsey Institute. So Callie's amazing. She has a more than qualified background to touch on this subject. And again, it's going to be a heavy or hard or large, difficult, intricate conversation but a necessary one. Surrogacy is something that we're not necessarily all super familiar with. So with that, let's just dive right in. Well, hello, Callie, and welcome to This is a Woman podcast. We are so excited to have you here and just to learn from you and all your knowledge on surrogacy. And with that, let's just dive right into it. For I know most people know what surrogacy is, or at least they think they know what surrogacy is. So would you be able just to give the brief explanation of what surrogacy is before we get into all the details? Sure. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Um, I love talking about uh, women's reproductive health. I love talking about big fertility. Uh, That's kind of what we call it at the Center for Bioethics and Culture. Um, So yeah, so thank you so much. Um, And then also, I would like to start, uh, I always kind of start with this because I recognize that when I talk about infertility or using um, reproductive technologies, it can be a really sensitive uh, topic. Um, I have friends who have used uh, surrogate mothers. I have friends who have used IVF. I think we can have friends and we can talk about these topics. without, you know, uh, or or we need to be talking about these topics, Mm -hmm. um, even if we disagree. And so before I start, I just want to say that I recognize that infertility is very painful and certainly a very sensitive topic. So, um, but it is a conversation that needs to be had. So just want to recognize that. So we can start by just, yeah, talking about surrogacy. 
I feel like uh, it's been around for a while, but I feel like just in the last like 10 years, we've heard a lot of people, uh, especially celebrities using surrogacy. And so we have kind of an idea. It's kind of showing up in pop culture. It's showing up in um, movies and books and that sort of thing. Um, and we may know someone who has struggled with infertility and then went the route of, of a, using a surrogate mother. Um, so I think the best way to kind of answer this question is to kind of give a fairly common example, um, explaining a situation and, and kind of working through it. So um, one of the more common things we hear about surrogacy is when a same-sex couple, especially two men, um, want to have a child and they decide to use surrogacy. So I like to use that as an example. So Elton John is, is one case in point. Um, so in order <laughs> to have a child, you need an egg and a sperm, right, uh, to create a baby. A lot of times the egg donor in surrogacy often is ignored, but there is a woman who is donating her egg in those cases, especially when it comes to a uh, same-sex male couple. They need an egg. Um, so um, they will have an egg donor. And then there are several options the men can use for sperm. One option is um, sperm donation from an outside party, or they use their own sperm in a variety of ways. Um, they may mix their sperm together so that each man has like a shot <laughs> at fertilizing the egg. Um, and or they could decide to fertilize and implant, let's say, two embryos. So one child being from each man's sperm in this particular situation. Um, so we have an egg donor. We have a sperm. Um, and I always kind of use quotes around donor because it's it's also a paid transaction. It's, it's not a donation. It's a euphemism. That's a really terrible euphemism. Um, so then... Um, in, in um, gestational surrogacy, which isn't really used, traditional gestational surrogacy, which isn't really used much anymore, the surrogate mother can serve as the egg donor. Um, this is much less common in the industry, and um, there's nothing really traditional about it, even though it's called traditional surrogacy. A more common scenario is for... Um, the uh, the dads to use one woman as an egg donor and a second woman as the surrogate mother. So then two women are used in the uh, creation of this child. Um, this is most often chosen uh, because it intentionally reduces both women down to either egg provider or incubator. Um, then they have no claim to that child as mother. You know, who, who is the mother? Is it the uh, genetic material or is it the woman who um, had the pregnancy for nine months? Um, so once the egg is fertilized, um, so both the egg and the sperm have to be taken outside of the body. Um, they're combined um, and they're fertilized and then the embryo is implanted into the surrogate mother. Um, and of course, both the egg donor and the surrogate mother are taking lots of medications, lots of hormones, prepping their bodies for this. Um, it's not just as easy as like going and fetching eggs and then putting them in a woman. <laughs> There's a lot of medications and um, testing and lab tests and all that that kind of go through it. Um, and so throughout the process, the egg donor and the surrogate mother womb are both being um, put on fertility drugs. And of course, the, these are both um, I'm going to hit on this point now because I might hit on it later, but these are not patients. These are not women who really need to be treated with medication, but they are getting medication. And those medications, of course, come with their own risks as well. But once the mother is, uh, or once the surrogate mother is implanted with um, the embryo and then the pregnancy starts, and a lot of what happens during pregnancy is dictated by the contracts that are signed, which is something I kind of left out at the beginning. Um, the family, the intended parents is what we would call um, a family or a person who um, is using a surrogate mother. They are intending to be the parent. Um, and they would find a surrogate mother. They would find an egg donor through various reasons, through various methods. And then um, they go into contract with her. So it's, it's all based on contract law. Um, so then the pregnancy and everything that happens is dictated by contract. So that's a very, very big, long, <laughs> maybe too technical overview of what it looks like. Yeah, I think it's so interesting how you dove into that there is the egg donor and then there is actually the surrogate mother who carries the child. I didn't realize that there was that split, but it makes sense that they do that because, like you said, it's to kind of make it like, 
it's not your own egg in you and that's not your child that's trying to separate the two. Um, which I think the only reason that's necessary is because again, the mother is giving up the child that's not hers. Right. And so they do that because this isn't a natural process, this isn't a normal thing. And again, I'm so glad you touched on that this is a touchy subject and can be a heavy subject with infertility. It's a hard thing that um, many men and women have struggled with, but we're seeing surrogacy being used. Um, we even saw in some legislation in California this year kind of talking about it where it's not just for um, a male and a female who are married and they're infertile, but it's now being used for um, homosexual relationships, but it's also used for individual people um, at, to some points based off of what state you're in and the different laws and all of that. Yeah. And um, I think that really, it, that's where this takes the step away from this isn't just to help those with infertility, but even if it is just to help those with infertility, can we kind of touch on maybe some of the moral and ethical issues that do come from surrogacy? For sure. Yeah. Surrogacy is often thought of you. I want to hit on this a little bit more is that it's a treatment option, right? For infertile couples. But what we're seeing is that people who aren't infertile are using surrogacy. Uh, people who just don't want to be pregnant or doesn't fit in their timeline, or maybe they waited too long to have children. Um, and we see that a lot in, you know, celebrities as well. Um, where they're doing single, um, single parent, you know, they want to raise a child as a single parent, but they still want to have a biological component to it. And um, yeah, you bring up, it, yeah, in California, we're starting to see shifts in that word infertility and the definition of infertility to include uh, just the inability for a single person to have a child, which is... Um, which is ludicrous in my own opinion. I think the formal definition was a person's inability to reproduce either as an individual or with their partner without medical intervention. I'm like, okay, well, that's everyone. Like, yes. I can't reproduce. <laughs> we are not asexual beings. So it's just crazy. But this is like starting to show up in law and, and that, that um, insurance would have to cover treatment for infertile people, which we all are by ourselves. Um <laughs> You know, <laughs> so yeah, that's a really important thing that you touch on that this is that this is happening and that we're redefining this term. Um, and I also think um, it's important to kind of think about that too. Is it's, it's a tr treatment option for the infertile, infertile, but we're not providing any treatment to that actual couple. We're actually medicalizing a person who doesn't need that medicalization, and it's important because. Surrogate pregnancies are innately higher risk. And so we're asking young women, young mothers to sign up for a medical treatment to help someone else that is inherently risky. Um, nowhere else do we do that in medicine. We don't allow, medical providers don't encourage risky behavior unless, you know, it's medically warranted. For example, cancer patients, right? Chemo might be really risky. Um, they might die from the chemotherapy. They might have terrible side effects, but their alternative is to die from cancer. Um, here we have a woman, um, an egg donor and a surrogate mother who don't need this medical treatment. They're signing up to, for these risks. So that's, that's one of, to kind of weed into your question about what, um, the harms and ethical problems are. That's just kind of one of them. Uh, there's a lot. So I'll, I'll try to touch on a few. And please, I like to talk and ramble. So please interrupt me if I like am going on too long or you want to jump in. Yes. Um, no, this is great. I'm loving yeah. it all. <laughs> okay. So really first, I kind of touched on, and I'll get to it again in a moment, is that um, surrogate pregnancy a lot of people don't realize this, is they are high-risk pregnancies. This has been demonstrated in the literature. Um, we actually, the Center for Bioethics and Culture, uh, myself included, and my um, former president and founder, Jennifer Law, uh, we actually did a, um, a research study of our own where we interviewed 97 surrogate mothers who had, who had so they had to have had their own children and then also been surrogate mothers at least once. Um, and in it, we saw, we saw, as we see in the literature, um, higher risks of C-section, higher risks um, of complications like 
uh, preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure, postpartum hemorrhage. And interestingly, our study showed too that these women had higher risks of postpartum depression, which we can get to later um, in their surrogate pregnancies. Um, so yeah, just to touch on the fact that this is an inherently risky to the mother. It's a high risk pregnancy. And anyone who's been pregnant, um, would know that if, if I'm in a place where it's high risk, if my blood pressure is high, if I'm at risk for delivering early, then that puts the baby at risk as well. And so something that we forget to talk about a lot in these conversations is the child. So I'm going to be referring back to the child a lot or the children, um, because really what happens to the surrogate mother also happens to the baby. And the babies honestly are left out of this conversation far too often. Um, so that's kind of like my first thing. This is an ethical problem. Nowhere in medicine do we let people take risks like this. Of course, there is a, we've seen like a corrosion of medicine in the transgender medicine space where we're letting people harm themselves. Um, and that's appalling and should be appalling. So this is kind of, I feel like the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't let um, men and women sign up to sell their body parts. Um, it's actually illegal, right? I can't go and sell um, <laughs> sell my kidney. I can give it away, um, but I can't sell it. And um, so on top of it being incredibly risky, um, we're also financially incentivizing it, um, mm -hmm. which nowhere else in medicine do, do we do that. Um, we actually get really, we try to divide those things very clearly. Um, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But the practice itself of surrogacy, in my opinion, is really regressive. Um, many developed countries have prohibited uh, commercial surrogacy because this is a human rights and women's health violation. Um, it depends, like I just alluded to, on the exploitation of lower income and poor women. That's why we see places like Ukraine, Mexico, these are hot spots for surrogacy. Um, it's cheaper, there's lax laws. Luckily, India was a hotbed for this, uh, but luckily in 2018, they shut their doors to international surrogacy, which is wonderful. I wish every country would do that. But many, um, Many people see this as a hugely regressive uh, practice. The European Parliament in 2011, they stated that surrogacy is an exploitation of the female body and her reproductive organs. Um, and they've also said that this is violence against women. Um, and then not only are we talking about that this is regressive to women, we're commodifying the woman's body, but we're really, in short, we are commodifying babies. We're, this is the buying and selling of babies, and it cannot be separated. Uh, this is 100% um, commodification of women's bodies and children. Uh, we have a film about this called Breeders, a subclass of women, and in it, um, we got to interview a woman born from commercial surrogacy. Her name is Jessica Kern. Um, and she talks about how she felt like a product. Like the first photo of her is actually being handed over to like her intended parents. She was sold for $10,000. And she talks about that, um, where she really felt like she was literally a financial transaction. And so I think that... That in and of itself is such an important takeaway. We are not hearing from, again, the voices of children who have grown up. Because now that we've had this practice for a while, these children are starting to grow up and become adults. We have started to see in do the donor-conceived population, so folks who are born from egg or sperm donation, maybe not surrogate pregnancies, but their parents had to use a sperm donor and egg donor, that there are issues with genealogical bewilderment. There are all kinds of issues. So we're starting to see that, but this is a population of people that we're not studying, we're not looking at. What happened to them? How are they doing? Um, and so th these are, you know, I think Jessica is great that she comes out and talks about her story, but we need to hear more stories from um, children who are now adults who have been, um, who are products of surrogacy arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, Touch on that real quick. I think it's, so interesting, like you said, we often make it sound like surrogacy is this great thing and it's a donor and all these things, but there's all these financial situations going on in the background, as well as it is the buying and selling of babies. And I think we see so many children that are in foster care or so many children that are stuck in and looking for to be adopted and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that 
that's where maybe we need to kind of target this to. I don't know exactly where you stand on that, but that's what I'm thinking just hearing you speak is why does, why you're not owed a baby. You're not right. owed to have your own child. And there's these children here that already need homes. They're already alive. And let's focus on that person. I know that's such like a large issue where you can dive into so many different angles, but that just kind of, when I hear you say that we're just buying and selling babies, it also makes my mind go to like a level of human trafficking to say yeah. it is basically, I mean, that's what human trafficking is. I mean, obviously there's two different levels, but it's all kind of warped together. And so it's so interesting to hear you piece um, these things and what you're saying. Sorry, go ahead and go on with No, the no, I think that's a very important point. And, and unfortunately in the news, there have been surrogacy trafficking rings. Like this is not, um, there are, which is my next point really, there are no protections for the children or women in these in the agreements. Um, so they're like, oh, they have a contract. Most women don't even know how to read a contract like this. And I, let me say that again, because that makes me sound like most women. Most women who are signing these contracts aren't educated to the point that they know how to read or protect themselves. They're, they're doing it for the money, so they haven't hired their own lawyer. They're going to use the agency's lawyer, which is going to look out for who? The agency and the intended parents. So when something goes wrong, um, they have zero protection. We um, have another film called Big Fertility, and it's just one woman's story. She was a surrogate mother three times, and each time you're kind of watching the film like, okay, I'm starting to not feel sorry for you because, you know, you, you've done this three times, and each time was terrible. Why do you keep doing it? But it just kind of shows, like, how – how motivated it can be to one want to help people because the, the language around it, um, the advertising, once you're in with the Facebook groups and the support groups, it's all about my bun, her oven. I'm doing this wonderful thing. It's, it's this really like, they really play on a woman's um, natural kind of like want and desire to help people, this altruistic. Something we didn't look at in our study was um, the professions of women. But I think that would be an interesting study because just talking to them, a lot of them were in service fields. We do see that military wives are targeted highly for surrogate to be surrogate mothers. They're kind of already in that servant mindset, uh, plus other things. I'm kind of simplifying it. But we saw a lot of like teachers or like, you know, kind of those service um, professions. Also, interestingly, in our study, Every single woman we interviewed, their family was in the lower third, like lower three tax brackets. So close to the poverty line for some of them. Um, nobody was in the top like three or four tax brackets. Um, so it's interesting. They said that their motivation wasn't necessarily financial. It was mostly altruistic, wanting to help someone else. But interestingly, none of them were, were what we would even think of as middle class or wealthy. Um, so just, a, just an interesting aside. But you're right. There are no protections to children. Surrogacy laws like the one in New York, the Child Parent Security Act that went into place during covid um, that contains no protections like reputable adoption agencies have. Um, there's no process like criminal and child abuse or neglect background checks. They don't go into a home and ensure it's safe and stable. Um, that's, you know, surrogate mothers are required to, um, do a little bit of uh, psychological and mental health screenings, but the same is not true for intended parents. If you have the money to pay, it doesn't matter. You don't have to go through any of those um, checks and balances. Um, and and yeah, I think personally, um, this, I'm not speaking for our organization, but personally, I think that foster care and adoption um, are beautiful. I, we, my husband and I did do foster care, um, but um, and again, I want to say this with such sensitivity, but it also just like to check ourselves, like that is very child centered, right? You have to go through a lot of hoops to become a foster parent or adoption. People talk about adoptive kids and foster kids having all these problems and, oh, you're going to have this and this and this. And why would you do that when you can just have your own, make it easy? Um, you know, and I don't want to say easy because it's still really hard and painful mm -hmm. and it costs a lot of money to become, to go through, um, a fertility agency and to use IVF and surrogacy. So I'm, I'm not trying to downplay that. But I'm trying to get to the point of the root of is this a patient-centered or is this a parent-centered decision, 
we really thinking about the child that we are having um, or or is this a baby child centered view? Um, and I think we're missing that a lot of times. It's, it's because I kind of want it. I want it now. I'm owed it. I have the money to pay for it. I have the means for it. So why not? Um, but we're, we're not owed a child. If that were the case, then you could just walk into any labor and delivery unit and take any baby home. Um, we don't do that for several reasons because there's a maternal fetal attachment. <laughs> that's really important. Um, and then also we just aren't owed children. Mm -hmm. We're not, that's not, that's, I don't know where we've kind of come up with this idea, but it's definitely become, um, mainstream. Yeah, that has. And I think that's, I mean, I don't know if you necessarily know the numbers or stats on this, but I'm sure we've seen just over the past decade, it changed from surrogacy being because a man and a woman was infertile to now that we touched on it's because just a celebrity doesn't want to put their body through pregnancy. It's because it's mm -hmm. a couple that can't reproduce together because that's not how we're made or it's a single person. And it's the idea of, okay, well, I'm owed to be in a marriage with whoever I want. And then I'm owed to have a family with whoever I want, have a child. And like you touched on, we're not owed that because there's only one way to actually have a child like naturally and that's the process that it takes to do that and so it's really interesting just also hearing how it's just not child focused at all and so with that do we have studies or have you seen there's issues of children that feel like they have their they know there's a bile or not a bile but the maternal the surrogacy mother do they miss that is there issues with the child's and the child's development with that yeah so this is a really understudied area um, there are not many studies at all on this um, there are a little bit more and I say little like two or three, um, showing the psychological harms of, of mother, surrogate mothers, but there are very few uh, looking at surrogate children. So you can take studies though, of course, that like adoption that separate um, a, a child from a birth mother. Um, and you can kind of come up with hypotheses, right? Um, there is one study that showed um, and I can't remember, I'm trying to think of who did it. There is one study showing that children separated in, in these cases show higher rates of um, like dysregulation later in life. Um, we can also, like I said, take um, if, if the child's born from like donor conception, again, if it's, if it's um, in, a, in a single parent or a gay parent where they would have used a donor. We certainly know studies are starting to be shown in, in donor conceived populations that there is some bewilderment, some identity crisis, some issues there. Um, studies are showing just like with adoption, um, the earlier that you tell a child, the more they know, the more open it is better. Um, but it's so crazy because in this world of fertility, we often find that that's not the case. People find out later in life that they were, that their conception story is not what they thought it was. Um, and so we know we can take again from, a, from studies on adoption and kind of apply them, um, to this situation. But unfortunately this specific case study has not been, has not been done. But we, again, what we do know, like, for example, you touched on this. We know that the 12 weeks immediately after delivery, anyone who has had a child knows, you know, oh, this is, we call it the fourth trimester, right? So you're pregnant for three and the fourth trimester is that like 12 weeks after delivery where the baby is really learning to adjust outside the womb. They're regulating everything. And then more specifically, that first hour, right? We, we encourage, I'm a labor and delivery nurse and a lot of places in the United States, uh, we use what's called, um, uh, we have to be like uh, baby friendly or we have to use the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. It's actually in California's health and safety codes that by 2025, all hospitals will adopt these policies of being baby friendly. And one of those things is that first hour of life, that golden hour where we talk about how important skin to skin is, how that helps. 
baby's temperature, thermoregulation. It helps baby's heart rate and, and um, blood sugars. It has all these wonderful benefits um, of knowing, like this woman that it that it that it knows so intimately, the only home that this child has ever known. Um, but interestingly, in cases of surrogacy, especially when it's um, two dads or um, they take that baby immediately and give it to someone else. The baby doesn't know them. They might have heard their sounds occasionally, um, but babies start hearing in the womb as early as the second, tri early on in the second trimester. But um, the mother and baby, like we know, no matter what, they're intimately connected, even if they're not physically linked. And so um, it's just crazy to me that we we know this like we talk about this benefit we encourage it but then we turn a blind eye and pretend that that doesn't matter in these kinds of situations um we also could talk about breastfeeding right like um some women will sell their breast milk as part of their contract um, that's great but we also know that supply is demand and that the best way for a woman to produce breast milk is to have her infant close. That's why we encourage rooming in in the hospital. That's why we encourage your baby to stay in the room with you. Um, so we're automatically causing this issue. And then we're commodifying yet again another another uh, product of you know a woman's capability. Um, so agreed. Yeah, I just love that point you make about um, the idea that we're just commodifying women. And I think surrogacy isn't the only area in the medical world we see this happening to women or women being lied to about what is actually going on with reproductive health and our bodies and our hormones and all these things. And I don't think it's necessarily like day-to-day -day women lying to each other and saying, oh, but this is good for you. But I think it's the lack of knowledge from women because of what's being reported from people that can get a lot of money from these things, what's being reported in the media, just a lot of lies out there. And so that just goes into when you talked about the surrogacy, the idea of, oh, you're going to, we're helping people. We're helping people have a child and you're a donor and you're great and you're going to make their lives better. It's we do as women, I think, have that natural want to help people, to mother people, to try to make other people's lives around us as happy and good as possible. And so that idea of like, by doing this, it's a wonderful thing for another couple or for a person. As uh, I think if it was the opposite situation, men would be like, I don't care. Like, but we have that natural instinct to want to help people. And I think, again, I don't know if you want to touch on this at all, but I just don't think surrogacy is the only place we're seeing this in the medical world. I think we're seeing it. We see people marching the streets and chanting things, but then can't tell you what a woman is and people cutting off their healthy breasts and then people trying to pretend to be a woman, like all these different things. Yeah. And I think it's, I don't know exactly where it started, but we really see women being lied to in the medical field about even birth control, hormones, all these different things. So I don't know if there's anything on that you want to touch on. I know that was a, bunch but no it, there is everything below the waist I think that's the mm -hmm. book that I was reading and it talked about how women are both under medicalized and over medicalized we're told we're you know uh like heart attacks in women are often misdiagnosed as anxiety um and so yes it, it happens all the time and not only do I think it's a malicious intent but yeah we're um we might be lied to there are other things but not only that, but I think, yeah, we're starting to see that women are just being erased. Um, I think it's absolutely terrible. And I had Millie Hill on my podcast. She talks about this a lot. She's an author and she wrote a couple of books um, about, uh, she has some birth coaching books and um, when, if you're pregnant, how to prepare. And she has another one that I love as well. Um, but anyway, I have her on and she speaks about this erase, erasure of women. A lot of people do, but I think Millie just does a really great job in the birth world, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, but yeah, like I work in a labor and delivery unit. I'm a perinatal nurse. And, w you know, th th I see it firsthand, this draw away from saying woman, mother, um, we have to say pregnant person or chest feeding, uh, which by the way, just really irks me because men have breasts too. Like <laughs> that word is not exclusive to women. Yeah. We still call it breast tissue anyway. Uh, but yeah, so we're seeing this like erasure of women and not only that, like you said, but it's, uh, we're commodifying women. And, and, and when you see these stories, right, of 
celebrities, especially in the, I feel like in the gay dad celebrity population, you see like her body or her belly or, or you don't see her at all. You never see like her head, but like it's, she's completely cut out of, of the discussion of the equation as if she didn't exist. And you never hear about the donor. You know, they've had to use a donor, whether that's someone they've paid or not. Um, you, you don't see that. And so, yeah, we have this, it's, it's, it's definitely not the only place you see it. And we also see it um, in other places of fertility. You touched on this about education. We do our women and our children, our girls, a huge disservice when we tell them that they can be anything they want, which they can, but there are, I mean, opportunity costs. If you take and you want a career until you're 50 years old and you don't put finding a partner and having a child on your list of things that you want to accomplish, that's an opportunity cost. You cannot have it all. And we're really doing a disservice when we lie to women and tell them that they can, because we've, we've started in the last decade, um, especially big companies. I live in, um, the Bay area where there's tech. A lot of companies are offering egg freezing, which is just another way to collect money from women. Um, it's, it's got not great success rates. Um, and the thing is, is, um, even if you take our eggs out uh, and then age, our bodies are still aging. Um, that's why they ask you how old you are when you become pregnant. That's why we categorize uh, women who are older. If they are, I hate these terms, but we use like geriatric or elderly or advanced maternal age. But it is important because you have higher risks the older you get and you become pregnant. I can work out my arm muscles. I can work out my leg muscles. I can't work out my uterus muscles. I can't. I can't work on that. Um, I'm aging and I do have um, we do have, at, after age 30, our fertility starts to decline. And then after age 35, it rapidly declines. And then even at 40, it's like near, it's getting close to impossible to have a child without intervention. And again, I think we need to do a better job at educating you know, we can have sex education. Cool. Let's tell them how babies are made. But let's also talk to them about planning. And yes, you do have a time limit. And this is something, it's great if you want to have your career till you're 50, but realize that there are things you might have to give up to do that. Um, so I just agreed. I completely agree. This is, and I don't know where this came from, but um, we're, we're seeing the erasure of women for sure. Yes. And like you touched on sex education. I think they do an interesting job on what they teach nowadays, but so many girls hate <laughs> that. And they, I mean, to be fully transparent, girls now leave that class and they know how to do different sex positions. Right. But they don't know, can I get pregnant every day of the month? Can I only get pregnant certain days? Can I get pregnant right. on my period? They don't know that. They don't know when's, what years is it now a higher risk pregnancy at? What age does it hit that point? Like, so at what point, and like, I think it'd be great for men to know that as well. So they could be like, hey, wife, this is the best time for you to get pregnant and things. But even women, we're, we don't know our own bodies and we don't understand how our own bodies work. Um, yeah. And I just think you see that with um, unplanned pregnancies. You see that with women that have been trying to get pregnant for three years and they're confused why they can't. And they we don't right. understand our bodies enough. There's been a lack of information and that I think that lack of information wasn't necessarily always on purpose, but I think having that lack has led to an easier way to erase us when we don't know how our own bodies yeah. work. Um, but just kind of back on the idea of surrogacy and infertility. So many people see surrogacy as an solution in fertility, but could you maybe dive into a couple better ways to help with infertility when women are struggling with that, maybe some more ethical processes they can take? Sure. Uh, I think this back, uh, piggybacks right off of the last kind of statement you said about not understanding our own bodies. Um, I think that it is really important um, if you're struggling with infertility, uh, first of all, infertility is not just a woman's problem. That's mm -hmm. also kind of a misconception sometimes like, oh, there could be something not quite right with, with uh, dad or, or your male counterpart. Um, and so uh, I think the first thing, though, is to find a physician um, that really is going to treat you as a whole. Because um, 
our bodies, especially our reproductive capabilities, it's it's not just again I hate this it's not just a bun in an oven it's not it's so integrated to um, our endocrine system what we eat how we exercise everything is influenced or everything can influence our reproductive capability and so I think it's really important to find someone um, that's going to treat the whole person it's really interesting to me how over the last few years the medical system is really about like quick fixes. Like I'm older. My husband and I are thinking about having our second child. Um, so I just went to my OBGYN, my regular doctor, to talk about I was still breastfeeding, all the intricacies of my own body, and just how quick she was like, well, we can put you on this drug, this drug, and this drug, and that will just help stimulate your, your cycle without even thinking about like, okay, well, uh, what else could be like I was still breastfeeding, you know, all these other things. It was just very quick. Um, and I don't know if that's because patients, women and men are starting to be more demanding. We're seeing that again, like we go into a doctor and like, I looked this up on Google and this is what I want. I'm transgender. I want you to chop my breasts off. Like this is what I, and so I don't know if that's like seeping into reproductive medicine as well as like, I've read this, I want a baby. So I want the fastest way. Um, so I just encourage uh, people to be patient. There are, um, which I just found out about a few years ago, um, and she actually now sits on our board, uh, the Center for Bioethics and Culture. Uh, but I interviewed, or we interviewed a woman, Naomi Whitaker, and she is a surgeon, a fertility surgeon that specializes in what's called NAPRO technology. It's a very holistic way of treating a woman. And if they need surgery to remove a blockage in their tubes or, you know, remove scar tissue, et cetera, that's what she works on. She works on finding the reason for the infertility, treating the whole patient, even if that's a couple, and, and going from there. And I think that's wonderful. So I think um, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't give medical advice, but I would encourage, I've, ha I've interviewed a, a few um, NAPRO technology doctors, one of which who actually used IVF for her own pregnancies and now like warns everyone, do not do it. There are safer, healthier ways to do this. It might take a little longer, um, but you'll feel healthier. Um, but because the thing is, is like infertility is a pro is a is not the actual disease it's a it's a it's a it's a secondary problem based on something else so let's figure out that something else so i encourage people to find that something else ivf and um assisted reproduction technologies kind of bypass all of that they just they just get you an end result which isn't always the case because like you said too there's a lot of misinformation out there there's a ton of misinformation about the success of, of IVF, the success of, of surrogacy, donors. It's all terrible. Um, and uh, there's a really great book um, uh, by Miriam Zoll. I think it's called Cracked Open. She does a great job of kind of just like talking about her journey with infertility and, and, and how it's not at all what you think it's going to be. Yeah, and I the point of it's not we can't just be looking for these quick fixes because there's obviously something causing you to struggle with infertility or have these issues um and i think we've i feel like i've saw a shift in culture where we're looking for quick fixes and i feel like we're starting to see maybe a little shift back i feel like mm. having conversations with people i'm starting to hear more like okay, well, I mean, you think of even like diet culture and all that. Don't go starve yourself for 30 days. Maybe <laughs> let's do a year long program and do like sure. something, you know, I, so I think we're starting to hopefully see a little turn back into what's right and finding that I know even myself, I've had the same doctor my entire life and they've done great. But unfortunately with the women's health stuff, they weren't too helpful. And I had to go find a naturopathic doctor who immediately got me like going and on a good plan. And like just hearing from him, it went to these things of like, I didn't go to him for any infertility issues, but he was like the way your body was regulating, this could become an issue that then they would try to quick fix instead of going back to where you were having hormonal issues, thyroid issues, whatever it is. And so it was really interesting to hear that from that doctor and just kind of realize we can't just fix something quick. Right. If you want to get pregnant again, you're going to have to do that quick fix again instead of already healing your body. Um, right. So that's super interesting. But 
this has been amazing. Um, is I always like to open it up at the end if there's any final thing you want to share or talk about, whether it's surrogacy, women's health, whatever it is. Um, just wanted to open that up for you to have a final word. Yeah, no, I just, I guess in finality, there's so much more that can be said about the topic. And so I'd like to plug, um, we have several films on the issue. Uh, we have Anonymous um, Father's Day, which is about sperm donation, Exploitation, which is about egg donation. These are all older films now, but they still have really great content. Um, we have Big Fertility, which is about surrogacy. We have Breeders, which is also about sur surrogacy. Um, and then I've also started touching on the space. We have two working on our third film in the transgender medicine space. Um, I'm in that space a lot because um, uh, kids, this eight, kids are being offered when they're you know put on puberty blockers and then um, cross sex hormones, uh, fertility treatment. And so they're kind of signing themselves up for uh, being uh, patients of big fertility later on without even actually knowing. I mean, who knew how many children they wanted at 10 years old and if they wanted children and et cetera. Um, so we have some films th that are on that. All of those can be found for free on our YouTube channel. So I just like to let people know it's a great way of starting conversation, thinking about things creative way rather than sitting down and reading a book. Um, our YouTube channel is cbc-network. Um, and so I just like to plug that. And then if anyone um, has any questions or follow up things they'd like to say, I always like to give people my email address as a way to reach me. Um, I'm at uh, Callie.fell, F-E-L-L. -L at cbc-network.org. Um, so yeah, just a sh shameless plug there for um, all of my workings. And I have a book coming out um, about, called The Detransition Diaries. It will be coming out in January. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, um, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so all of you that are either, if you're listening or watching, um, just go to the caption. I will link all of that so you guys can find all that information easily um but thank you so much oh, oh yes can i say one more sorry yes absolutely um also really importantly i actually just finished it this year and i can't believe um there's two things if you want to find our study on surrogate mothers that can be found on our website cbc-network.org um and i can i can send you a link directly just to the study that's been published on surrogate mothers that we did and then also because I have so many people ask me about all of the intricacies of ART, I did a comprehensive, which is probably already out to date because there's research all the time that's changing, um, but I did a comprehensive report on the risks of assisted reproductive technology. And it has many pages and it's divided by sections. So like egg donors, sperm donors, child of egg donor, child of surrogacy. And you can kind of read through the medical literature um, and, and read it that way. So that's also on our website. It's a great resource just to kind of find other studies that have been done, get you thinking about these topics. So I'd like to plug that as well. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, again, I'll put that all in the caption so everyone can have access to all right. that. I mean, I've gone through so many of the different articles and journals you've written online and they're just so informative, so amazing. So I know this is such a heavy topic, such a large topic. There's so much inf misinformation going on about surrogacy and reproductive health. So I 100% recommend going into the caption, clicking all those links and checking out all this information because this is a 45 minute podcast, but we could sit here for days, I'm sure, and talk about all the intricacies <laughs> of this. But thank you so much, Callie, for being on. And I mean, I thank know you. everyone listening is going to love it because I feel like I loved it and learned so much from you. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it.